the N case M1 is nothing new in the small form factor scene. In fact, it launched over three years ago. Since its launch, it has undergone five iterations from version one up to version five, which we'll be taking a look at today. Now, I didn't have this case sent to me to review, as many of you know, and it's actually housing my main PC that I use for video editing and gaming. Over the last four months of owning the case, including many rebuilds, I'm going to give you my thoughts and opinions on the N-Case M1, including what I like about it, and also some of the compromises that you'll have to face when going with such a small ITX case, because despite it being so optimized, there are a few. So let's take a look, but before we go any further and you start drooling on the keyboard, do know that currently the N-Case M1 goes for 185 US dollars, which is a little more than what most people are willing to budget for their PC case. Let's start with a quick look around the exterior before we talk compatibility. The case is made by Lee and & Lee, and if you expected nothing but premium quality materials, you'd be 100% correct. The aluminium side panels are precisely cut, allowing them to fit together nicely, and are completely toolless, which I can definitely appreciate after rebuilding inside the case over and over again. The top and both side panels have an open vent design, which allows for passive cooling throughout the case. And this is definitely important for a case this small. With all of those hot components tightly packed together, this should allow for better airflow. The case comes in either black or silver and do attract fingerprints, so just keep that in mind when handling it. Now, let's take a look at component compatibility. And of course, seeing as it's a mini ITX case, you're going to be restricted with an ITX motherboard, but still two RAM slots, a single PCIe slot, and a powerful CPU socket, there's not much to complain about, and you can definitely build a powerful system within those restrictions. Choosing a compatible power supply is not too difficult either, and I'd recommend sticking to the SFX form factor, although the M1 does allow for larger power supplies such as the SFX L and even the ATX form factor. However, taking up that much space inside the case does restrict your choice of GPU. For example, if ATX is your thing, you're going to be limited with GPUs with a maximum length of 195mm, which means no full length GPUs, which offer better performance and cooling. Again, SFX is highly recommended here, and you still get a ton of power, with Lee & Lee offering a 750 watt SFX power supply, but Corsair and Silverstone's more modest 450 to 600 watt variants are definitely the more popular options here. However, going the SFX power supply route, there still are some GPU limitations. The most concerning being the width of the card, being restricted to 140mm for two slot cards, excluding the MSI Gaming X cards and EVGA for the win cards unless you want to modify the power connectors. In terms of max GPU length, the M1 allows 317mm for the top two slots and 279mm for the third slot. The only conflict I can see here is the newly announced 2.5 slot GTX 1080 Ti's, specifically the ASUS Strix and Gigabyte Aorus cards, which extend up to 290mm. CPU cooler compatibility is probably the largest restriction when going with the M1 with a max cooler height of 130mm. The Cryorig M9 cooler which we see here has a height of 125mm making it a great fit for the case, but definitely a close one with only 5mm of clearance. Liquid AIOs are an interesting point of discussion for the M1 with full support for 120mm and 240mm radiators with mounting on the included side bracket. Although do keep in mind that tucking away and essentially sandwiching the AIO tubes between the motherboard and the AIO does put some strain on the CPU water block mount and this is why a lot of enthusiasts in the small form factor community suggest avoiding AIOs altogether when it comes to the M1. If you are desperate to water cool however, a full custom water loop is recommended and definitely doable and I'd recommend positioning a slim 240mm radiator in the bottom section of the case right underneath the GPU. Talking about the bottom section of the case, you have plenty of options here from stacked 2.5 inch drives, a single 3.5 inch drive, or what I've seen to be most popular, two 120mm fans pulling air into the case. There's been a lot of skepticism however whether these fans actually do anything useful for the GPU or CPU load temperatures. And I promised a few of you guys that I would actually test this when I reviewed the case. So here we go. With the fans completely removed and at full GPU load in Heaven 4.0, we see the GPU hitting 79 degrees at 72% fan speed, with the CPU at 56 degrees at 76% fan speed. With the 120mm fans in there spinning at 80%, we have the GPU now 4 degrees cooler at 75 with a slower fan speed of 65%. 
and the CPU temperatures also dropped a couple of degrees, down to 54 here now, with a slight reduction in fan speed as well. So there it is. Bottom intake fans on the M1 are actually useful. I'm glad to put that one to rest after seeing it over and over again. Now, let's talk about where you're going to put your drives. The most common home for two and a half inch drives is in the front section here behind the front panel but you can also install them directly behind it as well. And going back to the floor of the M1, you can also locate them on the left here underneath the GPU. And by the way, the included mounts allow you to stack two SSDs on top of each other, which essentially doubles your potential drive capacity. Most people won't have more than two SSDs, however, and I'd recommend stacking two of them in the front section. For larger three and a half inch drives, you can install a pair of them with the included side bracket, which sits in front of the SFX power supply and also a single drive on the floor as well. So in total, the case allows for three three and a half inch drives or five two and a half inch drives. And that my friends is pretty much everything you need to know to build an entire system inside the M1. Now, actually building inside this case isn't as hard as most people make it out to be. Seeing as all the panels pop off so easy and the case is really light, it really is quite easy to work with. I did make some improvements on the overall aesthetics of the case, however, and these are a couple things I'd like to see implemented for version 6 of the case if possible. First things first, the feet. Now, a lot of people probably couldn't care less, but the small form factor PC market really are concerned with making a clean, neat looking rig, and in my opinion, these peg-like feet on the M1 really throw the design right off. Instead of just using the same feet as the Lian Li PC-08, why not design something special for the M1 with a sharper, angular design? I ended up designing and 3D printing my own, which I believe works really well, giving the case the stance it deserves. And if you want to get your hands on a set of these for your own M1, then you can check out the link in the description. Another option I'd like to see included for the M1 is a tempered glass side panel. And again, I decided to go ahead and make my own, but the implementation is not perfect and something from a factory would look a little bit better. I don't believe temperatures are a major concern here either, as I haven't seen anything ridiculous with my particular configuration. So what do you guys think of the NKS M1? Is the asking price of 185 US dollars really worth it? If you currently have an M1 build, I'd like to know what parts you're using. So please drop that down in the comments below. As always, a huge thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.